Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Simon Soon. I'm a senior lecturer in the Visual Arts Program, Cultural Center, University of Malaya. Uh, I will be taking over uh, week eight, week nine, and week 11 uh, for the Visual Arts Methodologies course. I look forward to engaging with everyone. Uh, I know that most of you are not directly under my supervision. Nevertheless, I'm very excited to learn more about your research project and please uh, play a proactive role in sharing your ideas with me uh, during the course of our tutorial discussion. As always, I am available for consultation or for conversation. If you want someone to uh, have a chat about your research project, feel free to email me and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. I'm open to the idea of uh, understanding your research project a bit better and see how I can help you uh, uh, improve on uh, your uh, uh, research skills, okay? Uh, so what I'm going to cover uh, on week eight and week nine are basically different types of approaches and they can be broadly uh, divided into two categories. The first is the extrinsic or the contextualist, contextualist approaches and methods, and this will be covered in week eight, while on week nine, we will focus on the intrinsic or the close reading approaches, uh, as well as exploring various kinds of building blocks tools and also methods uh, that can help you organize your research data a lot better. Uh, all right. And then finally, we will meet again on week 11 uh, to discuss uh, this very uh, difficult and challenging component of writing a research thesis. Uh, basically trying to understand what is an argument in the context of a research thesis, okay? Uh, you'll notice that I'm not teaching you on week 10. Uh, this week, on, on week 10, it will be led by uh, Dr. Roslina, uh, who will be focusing on how you can approach humanities research using quantitative methods. So what I will not be covering is the quantitative approach and methods. Uh, to doing research. Uh, but I want to clarify uh, what I mean uh, by this uh, because a lot of students tend to get rather confused uh, as to what counts as qualitative or what counts as quantitative. And basically, uh, why are there these two different approaches? Okay, uh, for quantitative approaches, uh, it's important to uh, remember that the approaches focus primarily, primarily on producing some kind of numerical data, meaning that they have principally to do with numbers, either through lab experiments or creating statistical models so that the researcher is able to identify or analyze patterns of phenomena uh, related to uh, his or her research topic. Uh, so in the quantitative approach and method, uh, uh, these approaches don't put a lot of emphasis on applying interpretive skills to understand the research topic. Uh, why is that so? Uh, it's because uh, when you deal with numbers, uh, you deal with a concrete uh, set of information. Uh, therefore, uh, when you bring in too much interpretation, they often believe that interpretation bring, uh, is too subjective. Therefore, uh, so unless you're dealing with the creation of these types of number focused data or uh, participating in some kind of lab experiment, chances are the research you're doing is qualitative, okay? Your research is still qualitative if you include statistical data or scientific reports in your thesis. Why is that so? This is because the main activity here that you're doing is actually applying interpretive skill uh, 
on the statistical data or scientific reports to help you understand uh, your topic of study. You're not using uh, statistical modeling uh, techniques uh, or other sort of like number crunching sort of like uh, methodology in order to produce data, okay? Uh, so, but uh, I think this is uh, where uh, the easy way is to cop out and try to sort of like adopt quantitative approach. But I think more importantly, you need to remind yourself is that while your research is qualitative, uh, it doesn't mean that it is not empirical. Uh, so we often associate empiricism with science, you know, uh, and empiricism is thought of as objective versus uh, the subjectivity of, you know, qualitative forms of writing. But actually that is not true because empiricism applies to both quantitative and qualitative approaches. And it requires the researcher to substantiate all claims that he or she makes with evidence of observation or experience, uh, rather than make claims based on knowledge that is passed down or hearsay. Uh, so you can be empirical if you uh, adopt a rigorous set of methodologies to undertake archival research, uh, to conduct your interviews, to conduct uh, surveys and questionnaires or design your questionnaires or to even do uh, participant observation field work, right? All these things do uh, 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 do exhibit, uh, uh, if done properly, these methods actually uh, can uh, be recognized as empirical. Uh, because uh, they show a rigorous and logical uh, process in which you use evidences uh, gained from observation and experience in order to make certain arguments that you are making in your research thesis. Okay, great. Uh, so what are we covering this week? We're going to look at extrinsic or contextualist, contextualist approaches. Now, uh, in these sets of approaches, uh, it is assumed that there are causal connections between the artwork and the historical period uh, from which the artwork emerges from. So when we talk about approach here, it refers to the perspectives and directions that can help us to understand different aspects of what constitutes the context of art. So approaches are often heavily informed by theory and different approach helps us to set achievable research goals. Uh, to achieve the research goal, however, we need to gather data, information, sources that can be used as evidence uh, uh, to support the arguments that we want to make. Therefore, methods are really the different ways that we can obtain information to answer research questions that are about understanding the context of art in this case. So uh, this is going to be a recorded lecture one where I will cover the different kinds of like approaches for you to think about. And then we will move on to a second recorded lecture that I will also be releasing this week that will look principally at different types of methods. Now you will know, you have noticed that there's really a limited range of methods that you can use in order to obtain data or information that answers to uh, questions that you have that are primarily about the context of art. So uh, if you were to uh, uh, approach your research topic from an intrinsic or a close reading sort of approach, then there's a whole different set of methods. Uh, it's important to remember that these methods are not exclusive or approaches are not exclusive uh, to one another. 
uh, you can adopt both. And very often, the best type of research actually uses different types of approaches and methods in order to arrive at a much more holistic and fuller understanding uh, of an artistic uh, topic uh, that you are studying. Okay, so what are some of the approaches here? Uh, I think the most common one is the biological or psychological studies approach. And this often focus on understanding the life and mind of the artist. Uh, and in this approach, uh, the researcher tries to find the connection between the life experience of the artist and the artistic work. Uh, so there are different ways you can do this. One is through influence studies. Uh, and uh, this is a very conventional sort of like way of doing art history, which charts the impact of a particular individual work idea or movement upon another. So for example, the study of post-impressionist painter Van Gogh uh, often traced his artistic breakthrough uh, in the late 19th century to his fascination with ukiyo-e uh, prints, right? Uh, so these are Japanese floating world woodblock prints from the Edo period. A researcher in this area might then trace how characteristics, features, characteristic features of ukiyo-e prints, uh, uh, including like, you know, how they often depict ordinary subject matter, the distinctive cropping of their composition, the bold and assertive use of outlines, the absent or unusual kind of like uh, perspective, uh, the flat regions of uniform color, uniform lighting, and absence of like you know shading. Uh, uh, all these then come to inform and shape the way Van Gogh developed a very distinct style of painting in the late 19th century. So influence studies allow us to sort of understand the process in which Van Gogh came to uh, understand, uh, draw on different sort of like uh, influences and uh, shape a distinctive and unique kind of artistic uh, style uh, during his time. Uh, so that's influence study. Uh, similarly, uh, a bit different is this uh, approach that is called comparative studies that focus, of course, on comparison. So, for example, a researcher could examine two or more works uh, by the same artist as a way to understand the artist's intellectual, personal, aesthetic preoccupation and development. Or the artist could also compare works by different artists working in the same medium or genre as a means of discovering the uniqueness of a particular artist's body of work. So for example, how is Jackson Pollock's approach to abstract expressionism different from William de Kooning's? Uh, both are artists who practice in the 1950s uh, and both are, you know, almost as, uh, you can argue, arguably uh, equally almost famous, right? Uh, nevertheless, they are very different and distinct signatures and approaches and understanding to, uh, of, of, of what abstract expressionism is uh, to them. Uh, therefore, doing a comparative study might allow us to see uh, from the perspectives uh, of uh, different artists working in the same medium or in the same genre, uh, to help us, and through comparison, help us to clarify what is unique about a particular artist's work uh, in comparison to his peers, okay? So uh, in this particular approach, uh, when you wanna deal with the biological or the psychological understanding of an artist and the mind of the artist, uh, a lot of research needs to go into digging up primary documents such as letters, journals, diaries, first-person accounts of uh, other peers or contemporaries of the artist, and so forth. Uh, what you do is you need to carefully investigate the artist's intention about his or her work. Uh, and this is, value, these, this is valued as a very important source to understand how an artist 
uh, understand uh, his work, right? Uh, uh, this approach uh, uh, very often is complement complemented either by the connoisseurial sort of approach uh, or visual analysis. Okay, so again, uh, as I mentioned just now, uh, these are never uh, exclusive uh, approaches in, in, a, in, in the sense that uh, the approaches also calls for the use of different methods uh, uh, that are not normally associated or come under its purview. Right? Uh, the second type of approach is the institutional context to understand the social, economic, and political conditions that surrounded an artist in order to determine whether directly or indirectly these conditions actually affect the artworks or the more widespread movements of which the specific works of art form only a part of. Okay, so the really quite a number of different ways we can approach this question of institutional context to understand social, economic, and political conditions. At this stage, uh, some of you uh, might be aware of this year how Black Lives Matter have, uh, have, have, have put a lot of focus on uh, the legacy of systemic uh, racial injustices within uh, American and European society, right? Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, it also sort of like calls for uh, researchers to pay attention to artistic representations of uh, Black people. Uh, so this in itself falls under uh, what we call gender, race, ethnicity, identity, and sexuality studies. Uh, in this approach, uh, the researcher focuses on different types of artistic representations of specific groups uh, that identify themselves as either women, gays, lesbians, uh, or even Asians, uh, or even Africans. Uh, you know, these kinds of studies examine the lives, attitudes toward or the social conditions of such group as either the background against which the, an artwork was created or as a phenomena reflected inside the artwork itself, often though not exclusively in works produced by members of that group. So for example, uh, let's take gender as an example because it's uh, also the most mature and developed amongst all these studies, uh, feminist critiques, critics have often uh, tried to understand historical ideas of what feminine is and how it impacts on artists' representations or assumptions about women. Of course, such kind of studies often discover that you need to also critique uh, the prevailing norm that is uh, centered on masculinity uh, that uh, then shapes a very authoritarian tradition of how uh, men view women, uh, either through misrepresenting them uh, in the way they depict women in art or excluding them altogether in the way that you exclude uh, female painters uh, from a social circle of artists, you know? Such tradition uh, is discovered to be uh, very alive uh, in even in the writing of our history uh, uh, and often is shown to be responsible for actually uh, silencing uh, the, num the, the, the many different artworks that were produced by women uh, throughout history. Therefore, uh, through a feminist uh, gender approach, uh, one way is not only one. The, the purpose of this approach was not only to is not only to then sort of like critique the prevailing sort of like system that has systematically excluded a whole segment of like the human population uh, based on this category of gender, 
uh, from uh, the right, uh, from the narrative of art history. Uh, the purpose of this criticism is also to then uh, undertake the work of locating and re-establishing uh, important works of art by women artists and therefore restoring them or giving them a place in public understanding or awareness of art history. So a lot of feminist scholarship then therefore is about doing and not only just the critiquing but also the recovering or restoring work, uh, adding and enriching uh, our understanding of the artistic past by uh, bringing back into our awareness women artists and painters uh, uh, who were actively practicing in the past. Uh, so that, there are different ways of doing sort of like feminist scholarship. Uh, so another approach, for example, uh, is to really apply feminist scholarship as a form of revisionist reading. Uh, so you can uh, we look at specific kind of, say, religious artistic practice in order to understand how uh, a particular religious culture uh, perhaps also contain uh, new ways of understanding what is feminine that is often uh, uh, not, re uh, that's often uh, de-emphasized in the way we write our history. So for example, uh, uh, in uh, the writing of sort of like Christian art, there's a lot of emphasis uh, specifically dealing with, uh, you know, Catholic uh, art, uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, the iconography of uh, the Virgin Mary, who is uh, recognized as the mother of Jesus Christ, who is uh, also God, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, reading and giving it, paying attention to why uh, the devotion towards the Virgin Mary became so popular uh, within uh, the Catholic faith, uh, also then sort of like uh, introduces another way of uh, understanding how despite the fact that women were severely limited in terms of how they, uh, how they are able to participate uh, in the decision-making uh, the higher up sort of like decision making processes of the Catholic Church, uh, uh, the idea of the feminine still have a very sort of like strong uh, and vibrant presence within popular understanding of the Catholic faith. So similarly, you can apply feminist approach to film criticism to explore this idea of what constitutes the masculine gaze. So when you watch a lot of the old Hollywood movies, uh, you notice that uh, the female roles tend to sort of like uh, uh, play out in stereotypes. You don't have a lot of female heroes or strong women characters. They're either screaming, uh, uh, always uh, in need of help, uh, uh, or they're like, uh, they're very sexy. Uh, so uh, very often this idea of what the image of the woman is constructed principally to serve the purpose of the male gaze. Uh, so understanding the gaze can help us to understand what is it that then sort of like shapes our understanding of feminine, of what is feminine in popular culture. So in all versions of gender, race, ethnicity, identity, and sexuality studies, they all share ultimately a common interest in the expression and interrogation of such uh, representation, as well as their relationship to prevailing power structures within a society. Okay. Uh, another approach uh, to understand institutional context is the Marxist approach. Uh, and in Marxism, and I think some of our Chinese students here will be very familiar with this, is that it assumes that history is a record of people engaged in struggles to free themselves from oppressive class and economic systems. So it's not just a study of uh, you know, class relationship or class structure. It, uh, it is assumed that history serves a particular purpose. It is to bring about a kind of awareness so that it can record uh, a struggle uh, towards some kind of utopian emancipation. 
But there's another sociological dimension to Marxism is that uh, very often uh, when what we understand to be history uh, is that it can only be truly understandable if we consider society's uh, mode of production and the different kind of material life that they afford, uh, meaning all the types of the cultural values or artistic expressions that are connected to a society is necessarily bound or determined by the economic conditions uh, of the daily life in the society. So while uh, these are sort of like the larger ideas that sort of frame the Marxist approach, Really, when we think of Marxist approach in relation to art, is that uh, a lot of it uh, deals directly with uh, trying to understand uh, political art forms as an area of research. Uh, uh, but actually, uh, there are sub more subtle dimensions to how you can use the Marxist approach. And this includes exploring uh, the different kinds of social, political, and cultural structures embedded within a society. Uh, for, so for example, you can explore like the evolution of genres, right? As a way, uh, uh, the art academy in Europe uh, uh, you, uh, was using to, in order to sort of like create a hierarchy of what it considers as great art versus what it considers as something ordinary and how these are then sort of like markers that would then help to uh, create a uh, gift an artist a, uh, uh, give an artist a particular rank within the academic sort of like system uh, so uh, there's also like for example uh, the study of uh, the emergence of new forms of artistic practices or expression. So for example, in the 1960s, uh, all over the world, uh, you know, installation art gradually emerged as a very powerful medium to account for uh, a new type of experiencing of artwork that is immersive, that invites you into a space that allows you to dwell in that space in order to sort of like find new kinds of understanding of your environment. So why is this sort of like important and in the 1960s? Uh, it's something that uh, I think the Marxist approach would try to sort of understand uh, in relation to also how these types of artworks were actually created, how they circulated, how they were received or understood by the public and by those in power. So you can easily ask some of the questions that are asked are, you know, when, you know, with the emergence of cubism, how is that related to changes in European social values in early 20th century Europe? Or, uh, you know, with the exponential growth of the art biennales, uh, uh, in the 1990s, how can we understand this as a significant political and economic platform uh, for countries all over the world uh, in terms of how, why they choose to organize art biennales? Uh, or if you want to even sort of apply this back into history, uh, why did the uh, Silendra dynast political dynasty uh, in Java commission the building of the Borobudo Buddhist Stupa monument in the eighth century, what was its goal? What was it? What was it trying to do? So, to answer all of these questions, a Marxist critic would argue that all of the questions above can only be answered within a political, social, or an economic context. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Uh, Another sort of like uh, institutional context approach uh, are basically three different types of approaches that share similar uh, sentiments or uh, ideas of how it views uh, history and culture. Uh, 
So the approaches in many ways uh, are heavily historical or sociological, uh, but nevertheless express a, a, a kind of postmodern skepticism towards uh, our conventional view of what history and culture is. Uh, so very often we think of history, uh, uh, our understanding of it is that it progresses along a linear time. So all things that happened in the past ultimately contribute to uh, the, the greatness of the present day. Uh, uh, and this present day is often sort of like thought of in terms of uh, the greatness of the nation or of one civilization. Uh, so those with the means to write history this way are normally the victorious one. So countries who are doing well today will write histories in a way that shapes uh, uh, events of the past into a narrative or a story that suggests that this past is something that ultimately uh, 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 contributes to a present moment, uh, present day success. Uh, so in this way, culture is also discussed in these terms. Uh, and often the uh, cultural forms, are, uh, when recognized here, are often divided into either high culture, normally connected to idea of how you want, uh, normally defined as something that is authentic or pure, versus what is recognized as low culture, usually thought of as either something that is mixed or hybrid or bastardized, not pure, okay? So uh, when it comes to new historicism, cultural criticism studies or post-colonialism, these approaches really try to disrupt this division uh, between high and low culture by really uh, avoiding this application of uh, judgment. Uh, so recognizing instead that the identity of a society and its value are constantly changing all the time. So to even say something is pure versus something is hybrid is nonsensical because all societies are hybrid. Uh, it comes out of a long range uh, of interaction between different people and different cultures and, uh, and made up of influences from both what is considered as high culture and low culture. Uh, in this case, uh, so if we look at, for example, new historicism, uh, when, uh, a new historic, when a new historian, a new historicist historian studies Shakespeare, uh, he would not so much study Shakespeare as a great English playwright uh, uh, who produces theatrical plays that embody truths that speaks across different uh, generations and different time periods. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's like timeless in that sense. Instead, uh, uh, a new historicism approach will look at Shakespeare's play uh, as, uh, as a product or an object to be studied together with other cultural materials from the same period of the Elizabethan era. Uh, and this could be, for example, a diary record of a fight in a 16th century English pub, or a recorded folk song sung by children in a village that Shakespeare used to live in. Now bringing all these high and low cultural materials together, uh, can help the new historicist, uh, can help uh, the historian who's interested in new historicism to construct the cultural and social conditions that make up Renaissance data. Uh, uh, and helps the historian to also understand the complex social politics of the time and how this politics then connects to the cultural life of English society back then. Uh, 
when it comes to cultural studies and post-colonialism, uh, these are then approaches uh, that are not entirely uh, different, uh, but they focus on exploring the significance of culture as vehicles of expression. Uh, they bring attention to different types of voices, ideas, and knowledge uh, from often what is called marginalized communities. Uh, so in the case of uh, cultural studies, uh, early cultural studies work tend to focus on uh, the culture of the working class uh, to understand their perspective, their voice, their ideas, uh, and their worldview. Uh, whereas in post-colonialism, the focus is on uh, uh, studying the voices, ideas, uh, and ways of seeing of uh, lo local communities in societies that were once colonized by outsiders. Uh, but uh, now, but, but in today's context, then have achieved some measure of independence. So in Malaysia, for example, uh, uh, we consider Malaysia a post-colonial sort of society because uh, 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 it gained independence uh, from Britain. So uh, applying a post-colonial lens to the study of sort of Malaysian art might require us to sort of look out for different ways in which uh, art is understood uh, in the historical context before the coming of uh, 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 oil painting or watercolor painting. Uh, what were the tools and what were the concepts of beauty uh, that uh, that are local to this part of the world, uh, that are indigenous to this part of the world, uh, so that we are able to see a different, um, to gain a different understanding of what art is uh, in other cultural contexts. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, in all these cases, uh, in these two approaches, whether you're looking at the view of the working class community or or other local community uh, in a post-colonial society, uh, very often uh, these views are recognized to have been ignored, suppressed, or misinterpreted by those in power who tend to see themselves as being part of the society's high mainstream official or dominant culture. Okay? And uh, cultural studies and post-colonialism tries to address this by showing us other perspectives and voices. Uh, there is also in the context of, uh, in the institutional sort of like context, uh, an approach that focuses on technological and material uh, base, uh, and the material basis on which we uh, uh, de develop a topic. So the focus here is to examine the impact of particular technological changes upon specific work, uh, art movement, medium, or discipline. Uh, so I think uh, the common examples or the easy examples to share with you is if you imagine like you know, the invention of color film or digital camera and how it changes the very uh, uh, use or of photography, of filmmaking, uh, and, and this is something that a technological or material-based approach would be keen to sort of like find out what is the extent in which color film, the invention of color film, then changed the way we understand photography, or the way we use photography, or the way photography uh, is, uh, or the way photography is. Um, uh, 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 how, uh, yeah, about, about, sorry, uh, reading the notes here. Okay, and uh, you know, uh, another example could be, you know, innovation of reinforced concrete uh, uh, when it was sort of like discovered uh, 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 in the early 20th century, uh, how it impacts uh, the creation of modern architectural style. Uh, 
uh, in another example I can think of is that you can think of the use of digital technology today and how it can serve to really preserve uh, a very fragile, uh, the, the very fragile type of glass plate photographic negatives uh, that were common in the 19th century. So how you can use digital technology in order to sort of uh, conserve uh, a lot of uh, 19th century photographic image uh, that were initially developed on glass plate negatives. So focusing on technology or material grace can give us an understanding of also what are the boundaries and what are the restrictions that artists face uh, or society face uh, when uh, then uh, uh, that then sort of like shapes the way they understand a specific artwork uh, or uh, their understanding or appreciation of a specific art movement or what they know or what they can do with a particular medium or how they approach a particular sort of like disciplinary knowledge. Uh, the next one uh, deals with something that is more abstract here, okay? And this principally, the approach is to focus on the history of ideas. And this tries to then explain artworks uh, in terms of the larger context of ideas, characteristics of an age. This leads, this, these leading ideas uh, can often be philosophical, scientific, political, or religious in origin. Uh, but are nonetheless profoundly influential upon many other areas of knowledge. So scholars use the word zeitgeist, uh, spirit of the age, to describe how there is something that infuses all types of intellectual discipline of a particular period. And this method assumes that uh, there is a commonality amongst uh, several arts, philosophy, religion, the sciences, and various other forms of uh, human mental endeavors uh, that comprise a culture of a given age. So uh, uh, in this way, uh, for example, uh, you can think of this very uh, concept of the modern, right? Uh, uh, as a spirit of the age, when people use the word modern back in the 1930s, what does it mean? How does it then, uh, uh, change the way people approach art in the 1930s, or how people understand what philosophy is, how people understand politics, how people understand concepts of education, and how it shapes specific sort of like confidence in the sciences. All these uh, 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 suggest that the, the modernity, the concept of the modern uh, encapsulates uh, particular kind of zeitgeist uh, uh, and that art is a domain in which you can then try to understand uh, how this zeitgeist uh, operate in the world and what it means to translate ideas into specific sort of like cultural forms and practice. Uh, other scholars have also traced the changes of a single idea through several different historical periods and its appearance in various media. So for example, you can look at the politics of aesthetics or even the concept of an artist and how it changes in different societies or across different periods of time. And then you can simply also think of maybe uh, Chinese or Malay ideas of what beauty is. How do you translate beauty into Chinese or Malay or Indian? Uh, you know, how is beauty understood in uh, Indian classical aesthetic uh, is perhaps very different from concepts of sort of like beauty uh, when we compare it to ideas such as the sublime uh, in a European landscape tradition, right? Uh, so under this same uh, area of uh, inquiry, uh, perhaps uh, some of the studies uh, tend to focus on this Thing that is called taste. Um, so when you hear people say that uh, you know, a particular period in time, uh, society uh, tend to possess certain 
type of artistic taste. Uh, so uh, history of ideas allows us to then sort of like understand uh, artistic production uh, in relation to the intellectual development and in the context of the ideas uh, that are associated with a particular historical period or a particular cultural community. Okay. Uh, the next one related is this analysis of the circulation of myths, archetypes, folklores, iconography, iconology, and other patterns of visual imagery. So this approach then focus on anal analyzing myth, archetypes, folklore uh, of these sorts, which occur and often appear as lay motifs within single individual works or group of artworks. The research uh, often focus on the historical origins of such stories, motifs, or emblems. Uh, so you can think of, for example, the Hanfu sort of revival movement in China today, or uh, the the use of Christian religious iconographies, uh, uh, or you know the concept of the vampire or the zombie. Uh, so this allows uh, the research to sort of like explore the historical origins, uh, but also to then sort of like map their reappearance in var uh, across various ages and in different types of media, and their evolution from one kind of representation to another. Finally, the analysis often demonstrate critical study of the social, economic, and psychological causes that prompt different types of manifestation. So if the zombie is a very popular genre of a movie today, uh, why is that so? Uh, and how is that different from the 1940s sort of like depiction of zombies in Hollywood movies of uh, uh, that is about sort of like, you know, uh, uh, voodoo religion, uh, whereas zombie then sort of takes on a very different kind of like, uh, uh, diff uh, it is given a very different sort of like uh, uh, set of sort of stylistic criteria that is uh, perhaps indicative of certain kinds of social, political and psychological anxiety of today that is very different from uh, the fear of the others that might inform zombie movies of 1940s sort of like uh, American Hollywood, okay? Uh, okay, the next one is really, you can also, uh, another approach is to then chart the development uh, of specific genre, medium or category uh, so you can consider the artwork in relation to uh, what is expected of the genre and how the genre creates certain kinds of expectation in audience of viewer and to explore how or the degree in which the work of art conforms or challenges those expectations. So for example, uh, if you want to sort of like think of Lu Sun's uh, woodblock print movement, uh, does it then challenge us to recognize uh, the political aspect of modern art, uh, right? Uh, so in this case, then, uh, you know, we have some, uh, maybe uh, uh, an expectation that modern art uh, is abstract and therefore not so political. But uh, when you soon, uh, you know, formulated his uh, woodblock print movement, uh, in early 20th century China, uh, did he then really challenge us to sort of like explore and discover the political dimensions uh, of modern art? Uh, so uh, in another, uh, another example, maybe we can think of how did maybe a local knowledge of cultural worldview uh, uh, belonging to a local community shape uh, different types of public understanding of museum in 19th century Indonesia. Uh, so uh, this would then sort of like uh, uh, 
uh, set up the museum as a genre that we think is something that is imported from Europe with the definition already fixed and to challenging this uh, definition of the genre by suggesting that there are other ways in which the museum can be understood by local communities that are informed or shaped by their perspective or their worldview, right? Uh, and in Indonesia's case, uh, you know, they're often called uh, gedung acha, meaning like a hall or a, a hall of uh, sculptures because of uh, different types of uh, classical sculptures that used to be housed in the museum in Jakarta. Uh, so the different ways in which a local perspective and color and shape uh, another way to understand what museum means to a local community. So this then leads to a uh, 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 connected approach uh, called hermeneutics that tries to recreate as accurately as possible the exact historical milieu in which a work was made uh, to understand the intentions of the artistic authorial consciousness that created it, as well as the audience subsequent response to it. In the hermeneutical approach, uh, what the critic does or the researcher do is to try to chart the, mean, the changes to the meaning of the work over time. Uh, so this is to say that it recognizes the meaning attached to an artwork to be historically bound and therefore uh, connected to a particular time. Uh, uh, a group of people uh, today might understand the work uh, to mean something differently from, say, uh, the public uh, of, uh, you know, the 1920s. So an author may intend to invest his or her artwork with certain meaning, but hermeneutics say that the, audi or the audience will always add on to that. Or to put it in another way, the text or the artwork will, as it continues to move across time, uh, to gather new meanings uh, that sometimes do not, uh, uh, that sometimes uh, does not even sort of like uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the the artist's original intention. So in hermeneutics, uh, it is assumed that interpretation is therefore situational and contextual and is necessarily a dialogue between the past and present. Uh, so therefore, uh, this type of method requires us to really sort of like, not just only apply, uh, secure substantial historical knowledge, but also uh, have an empathetic sort of like understand of the psychological dimension of how uh, people find meaning in certain things, uh, as well as uh, understanding all of this in relation to uh, how specific art forms uh, are given or can communicate uh, different things to different people across different time periods, okay? Uh, so another aspect of uh, connected to the hermeneutics is reception theory. And this is really focusing on the audience role in the producing of the meaning of the artwork. So when you talk about reception theory is, you can think very simply about how, uh, you know, when this great exhibition was being uh, organized, what was the public's perception of the exhibition in the 1900s, uh, for example? Now, where would you look for this information? You might have to look at the newspapers. You might have to look at uh, uh, people's uh, personal diaries that have survived, huh? uh, that, uh, that have survived uh, to the present day. Uh, you might have to rely on oral history interviews. All these do help to sort of like reconstruct how everyday people uh, understand uh, 
an, uh, an interpret an artwork uh, at different periods in time. So this typically differs from the, uh, the conventional way we write about art that focuses on the intentions of artists and the conditions leading to the creation of the work. Uh, or, or it focuses on the artistic creation process. Instead, reception asks us to focus on the people uh, who sees the work and how they understand the work or how they interpret it, uh, okay, and why they find it sort of like meaningful. And therefore, uh, I think an important work is towards Hall 1973 essay, Encoding and Decoding in Television Discourse, that recognizes artwork not simply as passively, as something that is passively accepted by audience, but that when you have an audience, they interpret the meaning based on his or her cultural backgrounds and life experiences. Okay. Uh, so we're almost at the end, and there are two more uh, approaches that I want to uh, quickly uh, speak of. Uh, the first is connoisseurship. And really, this is the oldest, oldest, oldest art historical approach, and often uh, involves uh, acquiring extensive amount of knowledge or comprehensive amount of knowledge about uh, works of art, uh, chiefly for the purpose of uh, evaluating them and attributing them to artists or schools. Uh, and this involves identifying sources, styles, influences, and judging their quality in relation to the existing canon. So in connoisseurship, the approach uh, is normally suited for building a catalog resume for an artist. And what is a catalog resume? Uh, it is a comprehensive annotated listing of all the known works for an artist, either in a particular medium or in all media. So if you are interested in studying about one artist, uh, it is advisable that uh, over the course of your research, you are also working towards building a catalog resume for that artist. And using the connoisseurial method, uh, you are able to also then verify authenticity and provenance uh, that can be used in research topics related to evaluating attributions and discussing its problematics. Uh, so there will, I think this is uh, important to acknowledge that connoisseurship also in many ways uh, connects and bridge uh, the extrinsic or contextual approaches with the intrinsic and close reading approaches because it also involves heavily on one's ability to identify styles and to uh, undertake attribution exercise that requires the kind of skill uh, that uh, is more closely connected or associated with what we call intrinsic or close reading methods, okay? Yeah, so the last one I want to point out is the curatorial approach. Uh, in this way, uh, we can also think of the curatorial, it's a very new field, but we can think of it uh, as uh, something that is, even though it's new, it's not, uh, it, it shares a similar kind of like uh, uh, approach to knowledge uh, with connoisseurship. In that, in, in this curatorial approach, it often uh, involves acquiring also an extensive knowledge of artworks by contemporary artists and very often this is building up this knowledge is for the purpose of involving artists uh, in creating an exhibition or an of a creative project to explore certain social issues or conceptual ideas so the curatorial approaches are often suited to creating an exhibition proposal or a creative project proposal that involves 
the selection of other artists. So in, uh, in trying to develop an exhibition proposal, the researcher will have to demonstrate exhibition design and artwork placement sensibility. And the researcher will also have to demonstrate capacity to produce a narrative or argument for the exhibition concept in spatial terms. Uh, similarly, this, uh, uh, the researcher will also have to then justify how uh, the format for the creative project uh, in some ways demonstrate uh, the articulation of the ideas uh, that the curator wish to explore uh, together with other artists that, uh, that are in his or her list of select, uh, selected artists to work with. So in, uh, we can think of then the curatorial as a way uh, uh, that is also opening up uh, uh, research towards a much more practice-based direction as well, uh, using making and doing uh, as a process in which we think through certain sort of like ideas. Uh, I hope these approaches will give you an idea of how uh, uh, rich and perhaps also how um, uh, very uh, the humanities research or art historical research really is. And it hopefully gives you also an idea of uh, uh, what you can possibly sort of like, how you can possibly frame uh, your research project. Uh, so, uh, all of these approaches uh, do, in many ways, uh, require, uh, all of these approaches actually sort of like do require the researcher to apply uh, rigorously uh, specific sort of like methodologies in order to obtain the kind of results that we can uh, safely uh, qualify as empirical. So uh, in the next lecture, what I'm recovering are the different types of methods uh, and going into detail, what they actually entail, what are the possibilities and limitations, what they're useful for uh, in helping you obtain your data to answer uh, uh, research questions uh, uh, that uh, takes on uh, a contextualist sort of like approach to understanding art. So if you want to understand what is the context of art, uh, uh, understanding uh, the context of art through any of these sort of like approaches requires you to apply uh, uh, some of these sort of like methods. And some of the methods are perhaps more suited to specific sort of like approaches. And we're going to uh, explore these methods. And hopefully in class, we will have also the chance to discuss uh, which of these methods are best suited to which of these approaches.